Well, greetings, everyone, and welcome to God's Unchanging Word and this week's edition of News, Nuggets, and Insights. Today is Friday, April the 14th, 2017. We are on the Friday between the Holy Days, and we're going to talk about that toward the end of the program. We get into the scriptures of our, our subject matter today. But we want to begin with some good news. This is a, a topic we've been covering ever since we began the Constitutional Christian this past summer, talking about the possibility of Neil Gorsuch or uh, uh, getting into office. As we mentioned in the last week's edition of News and Nuggets, we said that he would probably be, uh, be sworn in, and it was sworn in this time with uh, something that's never been done for the Supreme Court by a simple majority vote as they would call it, the nuclear option. In any case, he is sworn in, and he is the next Supreme Court Justice, which gives the conservative party the edge in many of the possibilities of lawsuits that would be coming up. It's something that we've all prayed about, and God has delivered for us. So as time goes on, we're going to see how this is going to play a huge, uh, significant role in the future of America as it continues to move left. It's a possibility later this summer there may be another seat come up for option. And we're going to talk about that a lot more in the future as time goes on. Today, the news, focus of the week. We want to follow through with a few things that we've been talking about for the past month. There's so much news that we just just impossible to cover it all. So we're going to talk about just a few things that we've been talking in the last month. We want to begin to wrap some of this up. First thing is the escalating world conditions. Never in modern times have we seen the formation of so many struggles coming to the top now as, as, in world conditions and creating a problem. About a month ago, we began focusing on, we said, keep watch now on Korea and what they were doing to test this administration. On Friday, March 10th, we first came out and we were talking about the tensions that were rising globally around the world and specifically in Korea as they were launching new missiles to see what the United States would do. Just last week, we talked about Korea again shooting the missiles and beginning to create a huge problem for the East. And, and as I'm bringing this out to you today, let me back this up. As I'm bringing this out to you today, they are threatening America that if we take any action against them, that they are going to shoot nuclear weapons into America. So now the United States has turned around the aircraft carrier back that was heading to Australia and is now back heading to Korea. To, to protect the waters. So this, this, this entire fleet is moving over that direction and something that we need to take and, and keep a watch on as we go through this. Terrorism. Terrorism, again, it just, it's like it's, it goes under the radar that it's happening so often that it's becoming an everyday uh, a common occurrence and a lot, not a lot of people around the world are paying a lot of attention to it. On April 7th, Stockholm, Sweden, again, a hijacked beer truck plows into pedestrians in central Stockholm department store, killing four people and wounding 15 others. He actually hi hijacked the truck and just drove it into people. So now the, the weapons of choice of the terrorism is real simple. You get a knife, get a gun, steal a truck, and drive it into people and kill lots and lots of people. So we're going to see this continuing to take place, and we need to be aware because these things are eventually going to find their ways on our shores. So, again, Stockholm, Sweden, a country where you would have never dreamed that this was possible, taking place just this past week. Now, this is where I wanted to get to just a few minutes ago, in Korea on April 9th. It's that we have the task force Vincent Strike Group, as it's called, in response to North Korea's provocations being sent right back to the, uh, the area of Korea and waiting to see what's going to take place. It's almost as if they want to threaten the United States that they're going to take action just to see what we're going to do. The tensions that are building in many circles of people who are responsible not that North Korea is responsible, but many people in, in, in nations that are responsible are now saying that what we're looking at in Korea, 
with China, with the Middle East, and with Russia, that we're looking at the foundations for the possibility that it wouldn't take a lot to push us over the edge into a World War III scenario. So how far these nations are going to push and test each other is yet to be seen. But what we're saying that in these areas that are going on right now, that we're looking at the foundation of the possibility of the next world war if things don't begin to slow down. Now, it could be that simply around the holy days that Satan's anger is rearing up and is going to be able to get the attention of everybody from around the world and deflects his muscle. So time will tell what we're looking at. In Egypt, in terrorism, 44 people were killed and 100 injured on Palm Sunday, the, the, the Protestant world's Palm Sunday in terror attacks on April 9th, 2017. We began several years ago, and we're going to bring that sermon to light again in the next week or two after the Holy Days, where we talked about the Muslim Brotherhood, and we talked about the change of, e of, of uh, the Middle East and the rise of the spring and how the influence of the Muslim Brotherhood, even though they don't seem to be playing a major role in the news, the influence of what they do and how they react is playing out in the hands of ISIS and the terrorist parties around the Middle East. And it's also having a major impact in the influential decisions in America today in government, believe it or not. Believe it or not. April 9th, two Coptic Christian churches were blown up and over 100 people injured and 44 people were killed. And so what we're witnessing is, is the uh, removal of Christians from the Middle East. And people do not want to say a thing about it. The biggest and the most heated issue today now is the Syrian chemical attacks that took place in April. I couldn't even bring you the pictures of all the, the children. I, I, I just didn't want to bring it. So I came across here where the chemical attack killed all the animals too. But you got pictures of babies and children laid out, strown out, and, and lined up in, in, in covers uh, of, of all these people that were killed by the recent chemical attack. The U.S. retaliated by now and the time you get this. This is not new news. But what is news is what the possibilities that the Bible talks about that's going to happen in Syria toward the end time before Jesus Christ. The U.S. retaliated with missile strikes as Russia moves a warship now into the region. And both Russia and Iran have warned that telling America, don't let it happen again. They warn us they're not going to put up with it again, that we have violated, believe it or not, the United States have violated another country's rights. It is amazing to watch these other nations who can support this type of evil and, and attack the United States for stepping in and trying to save human life. Unbelievable what's taking place. Iran vows it will take action. How will they take it? Probably through some other terrorists. They have no power of their own against the United States. They will probably find some way of supplementing income, maybe from the money we gave to them from the previous administration, to finance more terrorism against Americans in the Middle East and over here in America. Here's what I wanted to bring out, because when you cover all of these news events, we try to cover the events that focus in biblical importance and in prophecy. Damascus is talked about in, the, in prophecy in the book of Isaiah, chapter 17, verse 1. It says this, that the burden of Damascus, it says, but behold, Damascus is taken away from being a city. It shall be a ruinous heap. So here's a prophecy talking about the city of Damascus in Syria, by the way, that before Christ returns, it's going to be one heap destroyed. It will be uninhabited. When we look at some of the cities around Syria today, some of them cities look like World War II in Germany just before the end of the war. There's just... There's just rubble and debris. Well, the Bible talks about Damascus. So what we're looking at, are we, and the question we're going to ask and we want to follow as time goes on, are we beginning to follow 
what the Bible is talking about before the return of Jesus Christ and the ruin of Damascus. And if it is, then we're getting very close to the time of Jesus Christ's return. So we need to, we need to be aware of that. Now, but I want to bring out one more scripture here in the same area in verse 4. Let me skip chapter, verse 2 and verse 3 and come to verse 4 because this is important for you and I. When this event takes place, Verse 4 says this, And in that day shall come to pass that the glory of Jacob, who is that? For people in the church who understand who Jacob is, who is the modern day Israel, and those who carry the name Israel, that's promised from the book of Genesis in the Old Testament, where he says, I will put his hands on the sons of Joseph. He said, I will put my name on them. And we see that in, in uh, England and in the United States, Ephraim and Manasseh. And, and in this prophecy, specifically, those two countries, as well as the other nations of modern-day Israel, the lost ten tribes, it says, The glory of Jacob shall be made thin, and the fatness of his flesh shall wax lean. So what we're talking about when you begin to see Damascus begin to be destroyed and unhabitable, what else is going to happen? We're seeing the nations of the richest nations on the face of the earth going through a lean period and a possible famine and starvation beginning to set in, which fits into the scenario of Revelation and Matthew 24. So when we follow these events, that is the nugget that we're looking at that we wanted to bring out in all of these events. Because you see, these events have to lead to a lineup of prophetic, prophetic fulfillment coming forward. And, and what we're looking at we may be looking at the very beginning of that formation being laid right now, the foundation for future biblical fulfillment. So keep an eye on this. Read Isaiah 17, verse 1, and we're going to talk about it in sermons and studies in the future as we watch the events unloading in the Middle East. Russia's not backing down at this point. They're sending the warships over there. Iran's not backing down at this time. We know President Trump is not backing down at this time. So we're seeing that everything is pointing to a war building up in Syria. With the, with the power that these nations have, they can leave this nation in ruins like we have never seen before. And the Bible says it's going to happen. Will it happen now? We don't know, but we will follow to pay attention to see. Okay, we are in what's called the mist of the weeks as we begin the Feast of Weeks in our countdown to Pentecost. We began with the Days of Unleavened Bread, which of this month was the April 11th through the 17th. In the Holy Days, the first and last was Tuesday, April 11th, by the way. We're filming on that day right after services here in New Orleans. We had a great turnout and, 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 a, and, a, and a wonderful Passover and night to be much observed. The last holy day is April 17th. But what's interesting about this is that God ties in the Feast of Weeks into the middle of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So I'm going to show you that. So now Monday is April 17th, which is a holy day. So now let's go to what the God talks about with the Holy Days. Leviticus 23, verse 4. These are the feasts of the Lord, holy convocations which you shall proclaim at their appointed times. All right, these are what God says are his divine appointments. These are something that we, we do every year that God brings us to us and as we rehearse. As the Bible says, we rehearse these divine appointments every year till Jesus Christ comes back. It says in Deuteronomy 16, 16, following through with the same theme. These three, three seasons a year, all your males shall appear before the Lord your God in the place which he chooses at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which we're in the middle of right now, at the Feast of Weeks, which begins in the middle of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and in the Feast of Tabernacles, which is the fall season. Now, Pentecost, let's tie in with the Feast of Weeks to what we're in the middle of and what begins to take place this week. The term Pentecost comes from a Strong's word with the Greek word Pentecoste, which means simply 50. Or some people would say 50th. But it's the Greek word for 50. Just as we would say 50, they call it Pentecost. It's a, it's a New Testament word. The Old Testament, the same day is called the Feast of Firstfruits, or 
the Feast of Weeks. In the New Testament, we, we see that in the book of Acts, they are given the Holy Spirit. You can read that story in Acts chapter 2. In the Old Testament, we see that when God led the children of Israel out of Egypt, he brought them to the mountain and he gave them the law on what we understand today as Pentecost, which was actually the 50th day that they came out on the morrow after the Sabbath, as we're going to read when, when it was done. And so we can put these two together and showing you what God has put, has put in his plan. So let's read in Exodus 34, verse 1, chapter 21 and 22, verses 21 and 22. Six days you shall work, and put, but the seventh day shall rest. In the plowing time and in harvest you shall rest. And you shall observe the feast of weeks and the feast of first fruits of the wheat harvest and the feast of ingathering at the year's end. That is what we just read just a few minutes ago in Deuteronomy 16. Where God says in those three seasons, this is what it's telling us the same thing in Exodus 34. Numbers 28 verse 26. It says, and also on the day of the first fruits, when you shall bring a grain offering of the Lord at your feast of weeks, you shall have a holy convocation. So on the day of Pentecost, God said that is a holy convocation on the, on the first fruits of the feast of the weeks. Leviticus 23, verse 10. Now, this is where people get uh, a little misunderstood as to what the layout of how you begin to count and lay out the Feast of Weeks. So what I want to do is I want to go through that and start laying it out the way the Bible tells us we keep the Feast of Weeks and how we count the 50 days. All right, so in verse 10, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them that when you come into the land which I give unto you, and you shall reap the harvest thereof, and then you shall bring a sheave of your firstfruits of the harvest unto the priest. All right, that pictures... Jesus Christ, who is the first of the first fruits, who is waved, where the priest would take and would wave the sheaf, it would be waved on our behalf. So we would bring in that sheaf of the first fruits of the harvest. Verse 11, he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you on the morrow after the Sabbath shall the priest wave it. Now here's what people get confused is they ask, which Sabbath do you wave it? on the morrow after the Sabbath. So for those who understand God's plan in the holy days, we know that on the Feast of Unleavened Bread, there are two holy days, two Sabbaths, one high and one weekly Sabbath, that fall in the middle of the, the, the plan of God on the days of Unleavened Bread. So the question that people get confused is which Sabbath is God talking about? It says, you shall, wave, you shall offer that day when you wave the sheath a he lamb without blemish of the first year for a burnt offering unto the Lord. Going on Leviticus 23, verse 15. And you shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought forth the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. So now, that actually tells us which Sabbath. So you're going to have to number seven Sabbaths. So a, a Sabbath is a seventh day to fall on the Sabbath, right? So there's no mistake. You can't use a, a, an annual holy day that falls in the middle of the week because if you add seven days to it, you don't fall on a Sabbath day. So you can only count from the morrow after a weekly Sabbath day, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. So you have to begin counting on the morrow after the weekly Sabbath within, I've got a chart I'm going to bring up here, within the seven days of the holy day. Why within those seven days? Because those seven days pictures the plan of God, the 7,000 years for mankind. So you have to pick it from within the time that God has allotted to man, which falls in the time of the seven days of unleavened bread. Then it goes on to say in verse 16, even until the morrow after the seventh Sabbath shall you number 50 days and you shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. So now let's make the chart up. All right, so here now I'm going to put in the chart. I'm going to put in the, the uh, days of the week. And let's show you which Sabbath we begin to count seven Sabbaths to be complete. 
All right, so we begin the chart on a Sabbath day. Now, this is the time of, of, of uh, the week of the, of the Passover with Jesus Christ. We know that Jesus Christ was crucified in the midst of the week, according to Daniel, which was on a Wednesday, which was the 14th. Thursday is a high Sabbath, all right, so that's where people get confused, and they begin counting from the morrow after this Sabbath, 50 days. And if you do that, you always come up with a Sivan 6 date, a Hebrew calendar called Sivan 6. So, but that isn't the date that God says to be counting. And if that was the case, why would he have his number seven weeks in the morrow after the Sabbath? And it's because these days vary. And if it was going to be on Sivan and 6, he would just say, just like, just like Passover, you keep it on the 14th. He would tell you keep Passover, Pentecost on Sivan and 6. So the counting doesn't count it from this Sabbath. It counts from this weekly Sabbath. All right, so that's also the first day of unleavened bread. Then you have Friday, then Sabbath day again. Right, so here we have the two Sabbaths. We have, we have uh, Wednesday, Passover. Thursday is your first Sabbath of the week. And now we have on Saturday again, the second Sabbath of the week. And so God says on the morrow after the Sabbath. So on the Sunday, you would always begin your count. And you shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath. So if I'm going to come to you and I'm here on Saturday and I say, I'll see you tomorrow. What day I'm going to see you? I'm going to see you tomorrow. The next day, which would be Sunday. All right, so when you begin counting from the morrow after the Sabbath, you always count beginning on a Sunday, seven Sabbaths be clean, seven sevens, all right, is what God's showing us. Which Sabbath do we pick? You have to pick the weekly Sabbath because the other ones you cannot come up with seven sevens, and that is the plan of God. Seven Sabbaths shall be complete, or seven sevens. It says, even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath shall you number 50 days. Pentecost always ends up on the morrow, right here, verse 16, on the morrow after the seventh Sabbath is complete, 50 days. 50 days. It always ends up on the Sunday, the morrow after the Sabbath, so you number 50 days. It's also the time we begin counting at, in Jesus' day is the day he ascends to heaven. So you begin the counting on the day of his ascension to heaven that sits on the throne. Why? Because it says he is the first of the first fruits, the sheave being waved on our behalf. He is ascended. The counting begins when Jesus Christ ascends. That's the first time we begin our count, seven weeks from that time. 1 Corinthians 15, 23 says that. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. So, so that's when you begin to count. When you begin to count for the 50, when Jesus Christ ascends to the throne, being the first of first fruits. Well, I hope that makes things a little clearer uh, as to our counting and why we do what we do as far as our counting. But that takes place. This coming week we begin the counting on the morrow after the weekly Sabbath, which will become this, actually, this Sunday. Coming up, we begin our count. All right, now, from our vault, let's see what we got going on from the church. We, from the vault, we still have the greatest deception sermon that's available online. We did it nine years ago, and you couldn't pick a better week to watch it. Bring some of your friends who believe in Easter and let them watch this sermon. It will be a revelation. It was nine years ago that we did it. It isn't the best quality compared to what we have today, but it's packed with lots of information. And I believe, if I can get some uh, uh, agreeing, aren't we mailing this out in, an, in the next week or so? I think we're mailing this, we're mailing this out. So if you, if you have requested it, you're going to be getting it. We're going to be getting it. All right. Or just view it on the web. You'll just view it on the web. All right, the other thing I want to bring to your attention is our Exodus series, the nine-point Bible study series. You should be now uh, into your Bible study series, uh, going through week by week into it. The week of 9 through the 15 was the introduction about the background to the series. Now, this coming week, the 14th to the 16th, on the second DVD, you should, you should be uh, going through that, that DVD, day by day, playing a little bit here at a time, and using it as your study guide, going through these Feast of Weeks for the next seven weeks as we get to Pentecost. We are in week two 
on the Exodus DVD series number lesson number two on the background of the Exodus and three the prophesied captivity both of those are on the same DVD so break it out get together spend a little time every day using this for your Bible study as you go through the week, feast of weeks also uh, we're going to have online our quarterly that went out just a couple weeks ago in the, in the quarterly is talking about uh, uh, well we have the spoils of Egypt that we're talking about in a uh, DVD coming out. And I, start, I actually started doing this as a one-part sermon. Then I said, well, I couldn't get it done in one part, so now it's a, it was a two-part sermon. And I just delivered part two today, and I still couldn't get it finished. We're going to have one more part. Next, next week, we're going to finish up. It's a three-part series is going to be. It's called The Spoils of Egypt, and it's filled with a lot of information. And it goes hand-in-glove with the Exodus series. So if you don't have it yet, please write in for it. It will be mailed out in just a couple more weeks as we get, get through this, when we get all the cards coming back. And it's called the Spoils of Egypt. And by the way, in the quarterly, we're talking about Passover versus Easter. So and it's filled with lots and lots of information. We'll also have it available online, too. The feature stories in it is Passover Easter, and a little story that I, I worked on called Risen, O Death, Where Is Your Sting? So... Uh, Get your copy. Take a look and have some exciting reading about God's plan. We also have an article which uh, Audrey brought out, my wife. It's, it's becoming kind of popular uh, in the churches, people talking about it. My mom used to say, it's really, it's a great series. And this one here is kind of ties into all the news. And uh, the quote she had there is, quote me, but don't misquote me. And also talked about from a couple of sermons, I mean, a couple of uh, articles from Anna, on uh, do you have a willing heart, and what's our lesson from Jonah? So lots of information in the quarterly. As we bring this to a close today, we want to, since we're in the holy days, we want to bring out another video by Dr. Don Patterson. Uh, Doc, we just call him Doc down here, became a, you know, him a real treasure to us when he was down here doing his video. And Jeff was going to our vault and found another video that he did after services when he was here in New Orleans a couple years ago. So we're going to play that video as we close out our program today, and it's called Adderdean, Adderdean. So if we're ready, let's play that little video, and we'll be right back. Doc Patterson is absolutely phenomenal on the piano. He's, he was the uh, dean of Wisconsin School with the music. He was, he's got people he's taught from around the world, and it just kind of brings a lump in your throat to watch somebody with such perfection play the music. And our videos don't do it justice, but, but uh, uh, you can just hear the music and uh, 
and just be mesmerized by watching us. His playing that keyboard is just absolutely phenomenal. Well, we hope you appreciated news and nuggets and insights as we delve into the news each week and we try to bring out little nuggets of importance that, of the news that's taking place around the world and uh, kind of filter through and see what God's got in store for you and I. So until next week, we hope you've had a great Passover, a great first day of unleavened bread. We hope that your week of unleavened bread is going well as you take in a dose of unleavening every single day as we're commanded to. So until next week, God bless you. Have a great last holy day, and we'll be back here right back here again next week, same time. God willing, we'll see you then. Bye-bye.